It's my pleasure to welcome you not only to the new school, but to the 23rd conference. I can't believe it myself. Uh, in the social research conference series, which we began in 1988. Our conference is one of the many activities uh, of our new this year Center for Public Scholarship uh, now uh, sponsors. The Center for Public Scholarship, which, is in, uh, which just began, really puts together uh, a number of ongoing projects we've been engaged in for a long time, like the Endangered Scholar Initiative and our journal donation project, which gets huge numbers of journal subscriptions to universities uh, in difficult places which are unable to get them on their own. We work in places now like Burma and Turkmenistan, Vietnam and Cuba, and in many other countries. The center now also houses the journal Social Research. Social Research has been the journal of the New School for Social Research since 1934, when it was launched by Alvin Johnson, the New School's first president, with the small group of exiled scholars whom he had managed with great effort and courage to bring out of Germany to the New School to protect them from the impending savagery that was beginning to unfold there. Most of those he brought there here had already lost their academic positions with the imposition of racial laws. This group was known as the University in Exile, and in 1934 became the New School for, became more, it had a longer title, but essentially the New School for Social Research. Uh, Johnson believed that the faculty needed a journal, which would be its public voice, that is the public voice of the faculty, and it, or of the, the uh, university in exile, and it was to serve the goal, that goal that he and this small group of exiled faculty began social research. And it was with that in mind that we initiated the social research conference series in 1988. The mission of these conferences from the start was the fostering of public discussions of matters of, of serious public concern, bringing to bear the most up-to-date, relevant scholarship, and hopefully making it accessible to the public. We try our best to explore each of the issues we take on in both the, uh, their, their current context and in their historical context whenever possible. The first conference in the series was in Time of Plague, which considered the AIDS, AIDS epidemic about which there was great hysteria at the time in light of the long history and social consequences of lethal epidemic diseases. Our most recent conference, which took place last year, was Limiting Knowledge in a Democracy, which explored these, the limits that erode and those that may protect a democracy at a time when privacy is being sharply eroded and the limits of what we are able to know and what we are allowed to know are uh, sort of uh, at loggerheads with each other. All the papers at this conference and at every other conference become special issues of social research. And one can order them. I think everybody gets an order form for the, the uh, papers from the, the issue that will uh, contain the papers, the two issues that will contain the papers from this conference. Now let me just say a word about the conference and a word about the topic. We all know that struggles over control of our bodies have a long history and perhaps are as fierce now as they ever have been. This is evident in the very heated debates over gay marriage, stem cell research, the legitimacy of abortion. It's evident in the Islamic world where, the, where law treats men and women differently, much to the disadvantage of women. It is evident in India where discrimination against the Dalit, the untouchables, persists. Other contested questions include what is a normal body, who defines it, how we should be cared for when we are ill, what in fact an illness is and, and what it is not, how we die, what rights the state has over our bodies, what rights they have to punish our bodies, what the relationship is between the individual body and the body politic, and what ways, are underst and what the, what ways the, uh, our understandings of gender affect uh, public policy across the globe. 
We thought a forum on these, uh, about these issues uh, was a high priority item. So this conference, so thus this conference, which brings together over 30 experts to discuss the body as an international human rights arena in which many forces, religion, science, medicine, media, and markets, to name but a few, struggle for control. The subject's a big one, so the conference is, and I sort of apologize for this, a very long one. It starts this evening and ends late Saturday. One last word, this conference, like all its predecessors, would not have been possible without the generous support and advice from knowledgeable people. We are deeply grateful to the Ford Foundation and the Arcus Foundation and the New School's Provost Office for providing the funding that was needed to make the conference a reality. I'm also grateful to somebody, at least those of you who are talking at the conference have gotten to email with, namely Roberta Sutton, who has done all the heavy lifting, and this couldn't happen without her. It is now my great honor to turn the microphone over to the new school's new president, David Van Zandt. We are very happy to have him among us. I will say just a few things about him, and then he will talk. No, I, that's for not, just because of the time. David Van Zandt is a sociologist and an attorney and a distinguished academic leader. He comes to us from Northwestern University Law School where he served as dean for 15 years. President Van Zandt is an impressively credentialed professor and academic, having obtained his AB degree from Princeton, his JD degree from Yale, and his PhD in sociology from LSE, from London School of Economics. He's the author of Living in the, uh, in the Children of God, published by Princeton Press, and a large number of law journal articles. It is my great honor to welcome the New School's president, David Van Uh, thank you very much, Aaron. And uh, actually, the, the, what I have to say will probably take less time than an introduction, so I'm a little, a little embarrassed by that, but thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real thrill um, to arrive here at the New School over the last uh, month or so and see all the various kinds of activities going on. Of all the things that go on here, the activities of the um, New School for Social Research are the ones I'm probably most familiar with, uh, given my uh, academic uh, academic history. Um, and also, social research is a, is a journal that I constantly uh, um, constantly refer to. I, my only gripe about social research was that it didn't accept some of my offers uh, articles that I submitted. But uh, we'll get over that. Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, I, and I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be able to welcome all of you to this conference and to thank those of you who have given up their time to be participants in this, um, uh, uh, in what is, a, it looks like a very exciting conference to me. And finally, let me thank Erin uh, herself, who with her tireless energy uh, is constantly organizing things such as this, contributing to the new school. Uh, uh, for a new president to come in with a faculty member such as her, uh, that's, uh, that's a real, that's a real joy. That's a real joy. So thank you very much, Arian. Um, finally, I think this topic uh, today is, uh, over the next couple of days, is extremely important. Uh, I did, uh, in the past, one of my past lives, I did uh, was the law clerk to uh, Justice Harry Blackman on the U.S. Supreme Court, who, uh, as you uh, well know, uh, was very interested in issues of um, the state and the body. Uh, and uh, so I have a, a especially keen interest in the, in the topic uh, that we're going to talk about today. Without more, let me turn it back over to Aaron, who's going to introduce our, our speaker. That's a big... <laughs> when I first met David, I had one impression. My goodness, he's tall. <laughs> so that's this. Um, it's now my great pleasure Ivan, to introduce our keynote speaker for this conference, Dr. D.J. Fassin, who is the James D. Wolfenson Professor at the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton.
He is also the director of studies at École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris and was vice president of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. Dr. Fessin, do you prefer doctor or professor? <laughs> okay. <laughs> has both a, remor a remarkable academic and humanitarian career. He is both an anthropologist and a sociologist, sharing the latter field with our new president. He has conducted field studies in Senegal, Ecuador, South Africa, and Fran France, trained as a physician in internal medicine and public health. His early work examined important issues surrounding the AIDS ep epidemic, looking at social inequalities in health and the changing landscape of global health. More recently, he has developed, by his own definition, a new domain of inquiry that he terms political and moral anthropology, analyzing the reformulation of injustice and violence as suffering and trauma, the expansion of international humanitarian government, and the contradictions in the contemporary politics of life. His present project, A Contribution to an Anthropology of the State, explores the political and moral treatment of disadvantaged groups, including immigrants and refugees, through an, ethno through an ethnography of police, justice, and prison. He's the author of many, many books and many articles, most of them in French. Among his more recent books is, and this one has been translated into English, when Bodies Remember, also The Empire of Trauma, an inquiry into the condition of victimhood with Richard Rechtman, which won a prize for the best book of Euro in Europeanist anthropology, and his most recent book, La Raison Humanitaire, which was published in 2010 by Gallimard. From this little I have said to you about him, I think you will agree that he's an ideal keynote speaker for this conference, and so it is my pleasure to turn the microphone over to him. Thank you very much. I'm deeply honored to have been invited to open this conference, and sincerely grateful to Arian Mack and the journal Social Research, to the New School and David Van Zandt. In fact, considering the history of this school, which you briefly recalled, I cannot think of a better place to deliver this lecture. The recent revolution in Tunisia has elicited many comments, but perhaps not enough consideration has been given to the meaning of the event that sparked it, that is, the self-immolation of Mohamed Bouazizi on the 17th of December 2010 in the small town of Sidi Bouzid, where I lived and worked a couple of decades ago. The 24-year-old street vendor who supported financially his mother, uncle, and siblings with his meager earnings committed suicide after one of the numerous confiscation of his wares and wheelbarrow by the police whom he was not able to bribe, and as the immediate consequence of the public humiliation endured as he was slapped in the face by a female municipal official. This desperate act, followed by similar ones in Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia, provoked a wave of protests throughout the country, leading to the overthrow of the Ben Ali regime and contributing, and it contributed to wider civil unrest in the Arab world. How can this event be interpreted in light of today's conference? The state has a foundational relation with violence. To paraphrase Weber, in the ideal typical social contract that links the state to individuals, it is supposed to protect society from violence via law and law enforcement, and in exchange, it is granted the monopoly of legitimate violence. The contract holds as long as individuals get sufficient security from the state and are not 
overly subjected to abuse by it. When it is not respected, either because security is denied or abuse is gross, individuals may feel entitled to resist the state or even revolt against it. In the model of the moral economy through which E.P. Thompson interprets the so-called food riots of 17th century England, it is when norms and obligations are not complied with that peasants rebel, in that case against landowners or grain buy buyers, but the paradigm can be extended to the relationship of individuals with the state. The foundational violence of the state, as well as the potential opposition of social actors, have a common site where they manifest themselves, the body. Kafka's allegory of the penal colony is illustrative of this. The sophisticated machine uh, used to execute the condemned inscribes the law he has infringed on his body in a long-lasting torture. Of course, in the real social world, the violence of the state can take various, often less explicit forms, from restricting social protection through budget cuts in the public health system, as in the United States, to brutal repression by the police against peaceful demonstrators, as in Egypt. Simultaneously, individuals have different ways of expressing their rejection of the unjust political order, from peaceful civil disobedience, as in India, to deadly hunger strikes, as in Turkey. The Tunisian example, or the, case, the Tunisian case, is exemplary in that the violence of the state and the resistance of the individual are embodied in one person. Mohamed Bouazizi is a victim of both the structural and political violence of the state. His dire living conditions are intricately linked to the corruption of the regime and the massive theft of public goods organized by the state and his harassment is the expression of the unlimited possibility of police officers and public officials to abuse with impunity. Facing this intolerable, intolerable excess of violence, the powerless young man still has the power to expose his life and exhibit his suicide as a desperate act to save his dignity. His body is almost simultaneously the site of the violence exerted by the unscrupulous military dictatorship, which is in, in itself is the negation of the foundational contract of the state, and of the ultimate resistance of the individual, which thus demonstrates how political subjectivity may respond and overcome political subjection. But this interpretation does not imply that when committing the gesture of burning himself, Mohamed Bouazizi was entirely and explicitly conscious of its signification. Who knows? On the contrary, by highlighting the presence and evidence of the body as the site of violence and resistance, I emphasize not a psychological but a political move. In a sense, Mohamed Bouazizi's act is the most violent response to violence that can be imagined. It violates, indeed, the most widely accepted biopolitical power, uh, 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 biopolitical principle, briefly evoked by Walter Benjamin in his critique of violence, the sanctity of life, of which the German philosopher writes, quote, the proposition that existence stands higher than just existence is false and ignominious if existence is to mean nothing other than mere life, unquote. Mohamed Bouazizi, as many men and women who sacrifice their life for their cause, demonstrates that just existence may still be higher than male life, and that humanity may ultimately rely on, upon such conviction. This may be a lesson worth retaining here, where political subjectivity is more often expressed uh, 
by killing others for their hatred than killing oneself for superior values. The way I've, I have approached so far the relation of the state with violence and the mediation of the body between these two entities is founded on the idea that the issue is fundamentally that of power. The power legitimately or illegitimately exerted on others and the power to defend oneself by usual or unusual means. Actually, violence emanating from the state or directed against the state has long been the main historical fact from the Roman Empire to the communist revolutions, just as it has been the principal concern for political theorists from Hobbes and Machiavelli to Carl Schmitt and Anna Arendt. Although this empirical reality still exists and its intellectual translation remains valid, we are not done with the question of power, of course, another dimension of the relation between state and violence mediated by the body deserves more attention. It is the dimension on which Michel Foucault focused his analysis in his last year's and final lectures when he shifted his interest from power, precisely, to subjectivity. That is the question of truth and truth-telling, or in a literal translation from the French, the question of veridiction. Unlike him, unlike Michel Foucault, however, I do not want to separate power and truth to go beyond the former to concentrate on the latter, but to analyze their articulation. My thesis is that the relation between the state and violence takes two forms which are linked in a specular way, in other words, as mirror images. The body is not only the site where power is exerted or resisted, it is also the site where truth is sought or denied. Whereas much has been written on power and the body, probably because of the most obvious dimension of the relation between state and violence, uh, as well as it is also the most evidently disquieting one, there is still much to be explored about the relationship between truth and the body. Let me clarify my intention. Instead of analyzing the origin of violence, as usual, either uh, explicitly or implicitly, I suggest examining its effects, or better said, its trace. If power leave, leaves traces on bodies, what sort of truth does the state, and more generally society, extract from them? I describe power and truth as mirror images since, since they are intimately but symmetrically related around the body respectively on the side of causes and consequences, as will become manifest in the two case studies I will briefly evoke. In the first one, based on research I conducted in France about asylum seekers, the body bears the truth of violence that the, stake, the state looks for in order to grant them the status of refugee. In the second one, grounded on a study I carried out in South Africa about AIDS sufferers, the embodied truth of violence is denied by the state. Asylum is, asylum is related to political violence. AIDS is linked to structural violence. In France, as in most Western countries, asylum has become a critical issue over the last quarter of century. Far from the great expectations raised by the 1951 Geneva Convention in the aftermath of the Second World War, official institutions in charge of asylum in France and in Europe are increasingly mistrusting refugees, to quote Val Daniel and John Knudsen's book. With a restriction levied on uh, immigration from the mid-1970s onwards, the confusion between immigrants and refugees has been escalating probably on both sides as some candidates to immigration may be inclined to apply for asylum and as governments tend to denounce so-called 
bogus refugees in order to justify their harsh policies. In France, in 1976, 19 out of 20 asylum seekers were granted a refugee status by the National Office for the Protection of Refugees. Three decades later, 19 out of 20 were denied this status by this institution, a proportion that is hardly modified when reje rejected candidates appeal to the National Court of Asylum, which only reverses one decision out of 10. Whereas Michael Maris concluded his 1985 book on the history of those he called the unwanted during the 20th century by enthusiastically predicting, quote, the apparent end of a European refugee problem, unquote, the global situation of asylum has turned out to be today the most problematic it has been since the 1950s. In this context, not only are the accounts of the asylum seekers describing the persecutions they have endured and the risks they would incur if they were to return to their home country discredited, but their voice can no, can no longer be heard. Lawyers speak in their stead. Volunteers help them with their applications, some even specializing in the so-called preparation of narratives. Physicians and psychologists attest to their past experience. Actually, medical and psychological certificates af uh, affirming the existence of physical scars or psychic trauma compatible with the story recounted have become a key element to improve one's chance of securing the refugee status. This fragile evidence is so often requested by asylum officers and judges as well as lawyers and volunteers, that non-governmental organizations which assist asylum seekers regarding their health problem and administrative issues are overwhelmed by this growing demand for expert advice. Quote, Dear Sir, I write in respect of the hearing of the Commission of Appeal. To obtain your refugee status, you must send me a, cert a medical certificate testifying to the traces left on your body as a result of the torture and abuse inflicted on you, particularly, particularly on your eye. Please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any difficulty." Unquote. This sort of letter written by a lawyer to an applicant has become quite common over the recent years. In response to those requests, medical certificates take the following form. Quote, this patient of Tamil, Tamil origin was reportedly arrested in 1996 due to his involvement in aiding the tigers and uh, incarcerated. He claims to have been tortured, hit with a bayonet, and burnt with cigarettes. Clinical examination shows at the root of the left thumb two scars, one longitudinal three centimeter, the other oval related to a cut. On the left upper arm, five round lesions typical of cigarette burns. On the right leg, several scars from knife wounds. On the whole, the observations correspond to the patient's statements." Unquote. Here, narrative elements are reduced to an extreme factual dryness, whereas, physical find whereas clinical findings give the most objective description of physical traces when they exist, and the conclusion affirms the compatibility between the two, story and diagnosis. At the height of the violence in Colombia, Michael Tausik writes that he visited a young far, young far left activist who had been arrested, abducted, and tortured for having denounced the abuses of human rights committed by the army and who remained profoundly affected by this experience, which he had miraculously escaped after being left for dead in a park. Quote, he proceeded to tell me how he was tortured, how bad it was when they changed the handcuffs for, ropes, for rope, how he felt like drowning when the, with the wet towel stuffed down his mouth, 
and what it was like being in the bag and shot but not killed. He leant his head forward almost onto my lap and guided my finger through the hair to, through the, hair to the soft bulging wound of irregularly dimpled flesh. Like the worshippers with Christ's wounds, murmured a friend days later to whom I was telling this." Unquote. In the political theology of asylum, the French state resembled Thomas, the skeptical apostle who could only believe after having touched Jesus', Jesus open sores. Officers and judges are often more convinced by a medical certificate than by a personal narrative. For the asylum seekers, the experience of the violence of the state is therefore dual. In their home country, their body has been the site of the inscription of power through the persecution they have endured. In their host country, their body has become the site of the search for truth via the traces proving their persecutions. Torture produces corporeal marks, and it is this imprint that bears witness for abuses. The irony is, however, that at the very moment when more physical evidence is being requested from applicants by officers and judges, torturers worldwide have learned how to minimize the traces they leave on bodies or off bodies. Moral tortures, including humiliation of which Abu Ghraib has become the infamous symbol, frequently replace physical ones. Sexual abuses, including so-called political rape, as it was practiced in Darfur and Bosnia, often leave no scar. Or more radically, all material proof of the existence of the person may be erased by, get, by getting rid of corpses in mass graves, such as in Cambodia or Rwanda. But when persecuted individuals seeking asylum cannot give evidence of marks on their body, they now have the alternate possibility of proving the violence to which they've been exposed through what is sometimes designated as the wounds of the soul, that is psychic trauma, or in its purest clinical form, post-traumatic stress disorder, which was introduced in the nosography via the 1980 DSM-3 classification of the American Psychiatric Association. Considering the delay in the transatlantic migra migration of the concept, it is only during the past decade that this new category, which attests the psychic imprint of the experience of previous violence, has been taken into account by non-governmental organizations assisting asylum seekers in France. In the research I conducted on the past 30 years of their activity, I found a remarkable increase in psychological certificates in which I observed a no less noteworthy development of the diagnosis of trauma instead of depression and anxiety, as psychiatrists used to indicate in their previous accounts. This growing demand for evidence of the physical or psychic traces of abuses to asylum seekers poses three problems. First, it profoundly transformed the nature of the condition of refugee. According to Article 1 of the Geneva Convention, a refugee is, quote, any person who, owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality and is unable, or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself the protection of that country, unquote. Consequently, the state of the host country should decide to grant the refugee status, status on the ground of well-founded fear rather than actually injured violence. Second, this evolution obviously disadvantages applicants who have no marks left by the persecutions to which they have been subjected, or who lack the medical or psychological networks to certify these marks. The case of rape is the most problematic and also the most frequent, since women or men who have been victims of sexual abuses generally have no physical scars, often do not experience post-traumatic stress disorder, 
and do not always consult physicians or psychologists. The scar and trauma bonus, as activists sometimes call it, therefore penalizes the majority of applicants. Third, this trend contributes to the disqualification of the world of asylum seekers. Their account of what they've, they have endured is considered secondary to the certificate of the medical or psychological expert. As their voice is silenced, it is their body that speaks. The conjunction of these three elements, change in the definition of the refugee, penalization of the majority of applicants, disqualification of their word, has precipitated the global discredit of asylum observed in the recent years. The more the state of the host country demands evidence from the body of the applicants, the more it reduces the spectrum of its protection to refugees, and ultimately, the more it facilitates the, the dirty work of persecutors, often with the benediction or assistance of the state in the home country. I remember a Bangladeshi man who asserted that he had been severely abused by local militias and municipal authorities because of his religion and human rights activism, and who presented at the end of his hearing at the court of asylum, a picture of himself badly injured in a hospital bed as a consequence of what he said to be a beating by the police. What proves that you did not fall from your bicycle? Asked the president. Strictly speaking, he was correct. When refugees have lost their moral credit, even bodies do not offer sufficient evidence. The search for truth by the state supposes a minimal level of trust not only towards applicants, but also toward asylum as such. The relation of the state and violence and the mediation of the body as ultimate source of truth is therefore somewhat easy to grasp when political violence is the matter as in asylum. But what about structural violence? During the 1990s, South Africa has shifted from being one of the countries least affected by the AIDS epidemic on the continent to being the one with the highest number of HIV-infected persons worldwide. This unprecedented progression of the disease occurred in the context of the replacement of the apartheid regime by a democratic order in 1994 after more than a decade of civil unrest, state of emergency, and finally, smooth transition with the liberation of Nelson Mandela, the lifting of the ban on the ANC, and the formation of a government of national unity after the first multiracial elections. The conjunction of the two phenomena, the biological and the political, was profoundly troubling for South Africans, whether the two elements were malevolently linked or regarded as an endless curse. As early as 1990, the charismatic leader of the military branch of the ANC, Chris Annie, who was later assassinated, had predicted that after apartheid, AIDS would be the next struggle. His intuition proved to be posthumously accurate. The disease did not, did not only provoke an epidemiological crisis, it, it's all, it also um, uh, caused a national controversy. On the one hand, there was the public health situation with a 20% HIV prevalence among, among adults, an estimated 5 million infected persons, and the announcement of a 20-year decrease in life expect expectancy during the next two decades, as well as the disturbing test for medical knowledge since the models generally admitted could not account for the staggering evolution of the infection. The epidemiological crisis was therefore literally a crisis in terms of epidemic and also in terms of logos. On the other hand, there was the polemic initiated by the President Tabombeki as in, and his health minister, who influenced by US scientific dissidents, most notably from the University of California, stated first that a virus could not be the only source of this modern plague, 
and that poverty was certainly the major cause. And second, that under these circumstances, antiretroviral drugs were at best useless, at worst dangerous, making social aid more than treatment availability the priority. From a problem of, government, of governance, the issue rapidly escalated into a national controversy as the country was divided not so much between orthodox and heterodox, as one often assumes, but between activist networks and the president's supporters, with a large majority of the black African population approving the latter's policy on the basis of racial belonging and political fidelity. The human tragedy had become a social drama. That is, in Victor Turner's terms, quote, the expression of a deeper division and loyalties than appears on the surface, thus revealing some dominant cleavages in the wider set of relevant social relations to which the parties in conflict belong." Unquote. There was more than AIDS to the AIDS controversy. This excess of meaning with which Claude Lévi-Strauss regarded as, quote, the very condition of symbolic thought and invited ethnologists and linguists to study, unquote, can be viewed as the truth that remained buried in the depth of the South African past. Like the occult economies and witch killings analyzed by John and Jean Komarov in the same post-colonial context, the anthropological exploration of apparently wrong beliefs, beliefs often unveils authentic issues. The alternate theories of AIDS, including conspiracy theories, and the support they receive within large segment of population in South Africa, but also elsewhere, including here, speak not of a medical truth, obviously, but of a historical truth, which as social scientists, we have the obligation to comprehend rather than denounce or deride. The colonial and subsequent national state in South Africa has developed and sustained the capitalist exploitation of the racial majority since the second half of the 19th century, most notably in the mines which Basotho migrants, migrant workers still assimilate to cannibals in the songs collected by David Copland. In a similar vein as Randall Packard's demonstration for tuberculosis from the 1910s onwards, it is possible to show how, in the case of AIDS, this racial domination and economic dispossession associated with spatial segregation have facilitated and probably sometimes initiated the dissemination of, of the infection. In the mining pits, for instance, local networks of so-called shubins and hotspots were made available to tens of thousands of men concentrated in hostels for whom alcohol consumption and sexual encounters were therefore the only distraction. This quasi-experimental setting for the expansion of the epidemic benefited from the support of the white supremacist regime with its pass system, which restricted the movement of black people, confining many to their workplace, and more generally, with its discriminatory laws, which subjected them to the almost unrestricted power of whites and ultimately prevented them from deciding on their own life. This was not only true of minors, but of most black men and women. Such was the case of a 40-year-old man living in the Limpopo province in the north of the country, whom I came to know well over the years. His family had always lived in this region where the Native Land Act more than three decades before the installation of the apartheid, had dispossessed black peasants of their lands, leaving them for only option to sell their labor force to the mine industry or to the new white owners. This is what the man did, as had done his father and grandfather before him, toiling in a large farm for a derisory salary and living in a barrack where the end, at, where the end of the week signaled the visit of women officially selling tra traditional beer and officially offering sexual services. In his early 20s, he left the farm for the neighboring town 
and started to work there as a gardener for the Bantustan authority, authority. But a year later, when the farmer ran short of labor, he forced his employers to dismiss him. The man had to return to the farm. He was married by then, and therefore had to be separated from his wife, who was a domestic worker. During the course of several years, the couple only saw each other once a month when she would receive her wages and could visit him since he was not authorized to leave the, the farm. Not being allowed either by their employers to have their own children staying with uh, one or the other, they left them in the care of the grandparents who brought them up like it was the case for so many children under the apartheid still now. This destructured family life ultimately led to the, the couple to divorce. One of the, week, of the weekend female visitors became the man's partner. She soon fell ill and he started to show symptoms too. He was hospitalized for two weeks, but when he returned to the farm, the owner, who had been informed by the, the physician that his employee was suffering from AIDS, told the man that he was fired and refusing to pay his last salary, chased him with a rifle. This is when I met the, this man. At an advanced stage of his disease and without earnings, he was relegated to the backyard of his sister's house, ostensibly rejected by his family. His emaciated body and his inexpressive face testified to his medical condition as well as to his personal history. Actually, they provided a truth about the epidemic that had scant coverage in the usual public health accounts, both nationally and internationally. In, in his case, as in so many others I have known, instead of being a cultural feature or beha behavioral orientation, sexual promiscuity, as it was designated using a stigmatizing expression inherited from 19th century morality and frequently applied to uh, African sexuality, sexual promiscuity was the expression of the grim exploitation and brutal domination imposed on the black population. But for journalists, physicians, and sometimes even anthropologists, it was much more gratifying to speak of the imaginary but presented as real virgin cleansing myth than to discuss the role of inequality in the dissemination of the disease. The political economy of the infection was thus the missing piece, piece of most interpretations of AIDS. By blaming the victims, the apartheid state had concealed this truth. By speaking of plot, the post-apartheid state unveiled it, but in a literally aberrant manner. Yet the truth was, was worth telling. It is a truth about the trace left within bodies by a history of violence. More than political violence on which the analysts of colonial and apartheid regime legitimately insist, it is structural violence, to use the, the term coined by John Galtung and later appropriated by Paul Farmer and others. It is about the embodiment of a violent past and present which take, takes two forms. One objectifiable which concerned the bodily inscription of living conditions poverty, abandonment, and humiliation, and their translation in terms of lower life expectancy and even lower value of life. On the other subjective, which manifests itself via a vision of the world constituted of resentment about the past and suspicion about the present, and in its purest form is expressed through conspiratorial theories. Epidemiologists can contribute to the measurement of the former and anthropologists to the understanding of the latter. In the case of AIDS in South Africa as elsewhere, the objective dimension was not acknowledged, cultural and behavioral models were more popular, and the subjective one was disqualified as irresponsible and criminal. Indeed, structural violence is a relatively abstract and elusive concept. It concerns the way historically constituted social structures interfere with people's needs, capabilities, and aspirations. It combines in various ways economic inequality, social injustice, racial discriminations, and diverse forms of denials of human and citizen rights. 
It is certainly more difficult to apprehend than political violence. Its relation to the state is more pernicious, but less obvious. Its imprint on the body is more profound, but less tangible. It has no immediate visibility, but there are also more interests at stake in keeping, in keeping it invisible, since its systematic unveiling could have unexpected consequences on the social order. This is why, whereas there is broad international consensus to criticize political violence, at least publicly, there is little global agreement or even concern regarding structural violence. In fact, as it was demonstrated by the food riots in Venezuela and Bangladesh, the natives' uprisings in Ecuador or Australia, the Al-Aqsa Intifada in Palestine, and the civil unrest in the French banlieue, to name just a few in recent years, it is when structural violence is reversed into violent resistance that it begins to be taken seriously by the state, and often repression is the sole response. To conclude, the relation between the state and the body is complex and ambiguous. It consists in protection and persecution, but more deeply, it has violence for its foundation, the violence it represses and authorizes at the same time. This violence can be political, the brutal exercise of force on bodies, or structural, the creeping inscription of inequality within bodies. Political violence tends to be denounced, structural violence tends to be denied. But the two are often intimately related. This is what I would like to illustrate through a simple story, which I believe poses complex questions. This is the story of a young Asian woman I met a few years ago in France. I will call her Marie. During the 1990s, at the climax of civil war and paramilitary violence in Haiti, her father, who was a political opponent, was murdered by unknown assailants, and some time later, her mother disappeared and was thought to have been killed. One day, a group of men burst into Mary's house and gang raped her in front of her boyfriend. In the following days, after having found temporary refuge at her aunt's, her aunt's, she decided to leave the country and to seek asylum in France. But considering they didn't have sufficient evidence of the persecution she had endured or of the risk she would incur if she returned to Haiti, the French Office for the Protection of Refugees and later the Court of Appeal denied her asylum. Having uh, become an undocumented immigrant with no relatives in France, Marie suffered from increasing isolation and depression. At some point, she was brought to the hospital in a state of, of profound physical and psychological deterioration. The physician diagnosed full-blown AIDS, probably as a consequence of the rape. He prepared a medical dossier for the immigration services. An article had been ad recently added to the French immigration legislation providing that aliens with a life-threatening disease, which could not be treated in their home country, could receive a temporary residence permit and get free treatment in hospital. Ironically, as a Kenyan engineer also suffering from AIDS, who had been illegally in France for years and finally obtained his permit because of his medical condition, once told me, this disease that kills me is also what allows me to live. Marie was legalized under this criterion known in French as humanitarian reason. What she had not been able to obtain as a right had finally been given to her by compassion. She was only one of many asylum seekers who, after being turned down by the institutions in charge of refugees, receive residence permits due to their medical condition. How can we make sense of this story? The state in Haiti, insofar as such entity did exist in those years, certainly played no role in protecting Marie and her family, and probably was even part of the violence to which they were subjected. But how to qualify this violence? Should we call it political or structural? Was Mary, Marie uh, gang raped in retaliation or intimidation because she was the daughter of an opponent? or simply because this sort of event becomes common in anomic situations. 
The answer to this question is almost impossible to determine. We know from the biographies of young black South Africans in the final years of the apartheid that the same individuals could be combating the regime and stealing from, uh, from their neighbors, demonstrating in the townships and raping girls in the streets, alternately behaving as so-called comrades and sotsis. The French Office for the Protection of Refugees seemed, however, to know the answer. It denied Marie asylum, considering that she was the victim of structural rather than political violence. Finally, it is under this rationale that she was granted legal residence as an aid sufferer rather than a persecuted person. The trace left, left in her body was recognized, but via her disease rather than as a consequence of an abuse. Empathy outweighed entitlement. From a pragmatic perspective, one could certainly argue that the important point that is that in the end, Marie obtained a legal status. After all, the protection of the French state is all that counts. One could think whatever meaning is given to the trace left on her body by violence. Objectively, this may be true. Subjectively, however, it is possible that being recognized as a person living with AIDS worthy of compassion or as a refugee deserving political protection makes a substantial difference. Ultimately, it could also be that for our societies to acknowledge humanitarian reason more than asylum has more profound consequences than what we would think. These apparent details which make the difference in the political meaning of traces left on bodies or recognized through bodies by states may be insignificant. But establishing that these details definitely matter could be a good raison d'etre of a critical social science. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judy. That, that was excellent. I think there's a, a lot to think about there. Um, at this point, I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, we have microphones at both uh, at the end of both aisles if people have questions. Um, but maybe I could start out a discussion by uh, taking off my sociologist hat and putting them on my lawyer's hat. Okay, and uh, you make a you make a distinction between. Um, political violence and structural violence. Uh, now the legal system, in order to have some, you know, something to decide, does need to make, make distinctions in some way. And the distinction the French system apparently has made, is, as the US system does, is between, uh, is between um, suffering caused by uh, political action and suffering caused by economic um, uh, situations. Uh, and the reason these systems do that is because there's been a social decision, whether right or political decision, whether right or wrong, in these, these are democracies that are making these decisions, um, that uh, while they want to open their borders to political uh, refugees, um, to open the borders to economic refugees is uh, uh, the same as simply just opening the border in many ways. And you know, whatever you think of immigration policy, uh, you can understand at least why you have to have a, some kind of distinction and enforce a kind of distinction there. So in, maybe my point, I think, is that the structural violence argument actually just proves way too much. I mean, basically, it, it, you know, it says just about anybody could, could get into France or into, into the United States. And again, you know, I happen to have different views on immigration, but that's not, not, not what its issue right here. Do you have a reaction to that? <clears throat> yeah, of course, this distinction between uh, uh, what I phrase here as political and uh, structural violence and what is uh, reformulated uh, as the opposition between uh, refugees, uh, supposedly political refugees, as opposed to immigrants sometimes qualified as economic refugees. 
this distinction, as I re reminded, uh, er, recalled earlier, uh, is historically grounded and has been seen after the, uh, uh, the Second World War as a major achievement, not so much the distinction, but the fact that the question of refugees could be taken and, uh, into account separately from the problems of immigration. In fact, when you read the, uh, the, the details of the discussions that, were, uh, that happened at that time and the debates uh, within the commission that prepared the, uh, conve the uh, Geneva Convention and the uh, political um, uh, actors involved around this convention, the question of immigration was already there. And so refugees were never a problem in situation of economic expansion, economic growth. They became always a problem in, when uh, this economic situation uh, led to uh, harder, harsher policies uh, on immigration, and then they became seen more and more as immigrants. So, so there's a, there's a historical background uh, to the, to this, and there's also an ethical or moral distinction, which is still dividing many uh, non-governmental organizations some defending that there should be a very strict distinction between the two, others considering that, in fact, this distinction is not operational concretely. So the question you're, you're posing is uh, an important one historically and, let's say, ethically. Uh, what happens, in fact, I've been observing for during several months, the work of the National Court of Asylum in France recently, what happens is that, as I gave you this very brief vignette about this Bangladeshi man, <clears throat> is that when the level of trust in uh, asylum and, to say it differently, the level of trust in asylum seekers is so low, it becomes almost impossible to uh, decide if you're going to grant asylum to one person or not on the basis of the accounts, some, sometimes on the basis of the medical and psychological uh, elements, as I gave the example in that case. And so uh, the, there are two different problems, I think. One is, is it relevant, and the case I gave at the end of this Asian woman shows, shows you that it's, uh, it may be intellectually relevant, but it is practically extremely difficult to know why this young woman was gang raped, and, uh, and even the mother, we're not sure that she was killed uh, as part of the criminal violence that exists there, or uh, if she was killed as uh, her husband, uh, very probably for political reason. So the distinction is quite difficult to, to, to make, uh, in fact. Uh, and the second point is that the, uh, the uh, res more and more restrictive policies that we have in Europe and that you have here as well um, <clears throat> make the possibility to be recognized as a political refugee, as uh, somebody uh, who is granted asylum, uh, more and more difficult. And uh, in, in, recent, in, in the last two or three years, uh, the, uh, there was a, a slight increase in France. I gave you the figures at the beginning, 5% of people receive uh, are granted asylum on the basis in France 
uh, on uh, the basis of the examination of their application by the National Office for the uh, Protection of Refugees, 5%. And it's about 10 more percent by the, uh, uh, so it's 15, about, between 15 and 20, uh, <clears throat> by the National Court of Asylum. Uh, the, the reason of the recent increase is, in fact, linked to two situations which are very specific. One is uh, homosexuals. The other one, more important in number, is uh, West African parents who get asylum because they claim that their daughter might uh, have um, um, genital mutilation if they were to be sent back to their country, which is a very specific kind of political asylum. Uh, but the rest, those who are uh, persecuted as a group or uh, for ethnic reason or for political reason, that is, those who declare they are, because there's no other thing than declaring and bringing some documents, but can always be uh, discarded as well. Uh, they are, uh, 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 they have a still a very low level of recognition. Mm -hmm. So the, the, in fact, the confusion between the two, that is, declaring most asylum seekers as bogus refugees is done by the state before being done by the individuals, I think. Mm -hmm. Good. Get a question from the audience, anyone? Um, I mean, I can continue to ask questions if you like, uh, but um, I, uh, I was also struck as, as you talked about the uh, fact that the body itself in your account is really just a uh, passive, almost a uh, a blackboard or, or an easel on which uh, political statements are written. Uh, and lots of them are written by the state, okay, in, in situations of violence uh, of whatever kind. And others are actually, you know, in one sense, from the individual, as your, as your example of the Tunisian um, a street vendor pointed out. And the body itself is sort of a, a, a it's a passive thing to write on, in, in, in much in you know, the way we, we decorate the body in other, in other respects. Um, does the body, is there something about the body, am I reading you right in saying that? Uh, and, and, and so really the clash is over, uh, the clash is over, say, the state and other interests, um, uh, and the body just happens to be the, the accidental, or really, it's a, actually not accidental, it's a good vehicle uh, to use to, to communicate in that way. Yeah, I think this is an important question. I, <clears throat> I del deliberately cho chose and uh, 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 adopting the angle of violence and the state, whether the state protects from violence or the state is accomplice of the production of either political or structural violence. Uh, <clears throat> I was. Uh, very much directing uh, toward this uh, view of of the of the of, of the body, although, and I could not develop it very very much here, but <clears throat> I uh, in the first case of the um, uh, uh, the um, um, this Tunisian uh, street vendor, uh, Mohamed Wazizi. Uh, and, and in fact, I could have kept on telling the story of this man in South Africa uh, where the, uh, uh, the, change, the change of the body uh, would have made it more expressive and uh, more active uh, since he partially recovered through tuberculosis treatment and anti-tuberculosis treatment and uh, and food uh, supplements um, <clears throat> and, and change completely not only his physical life but also his social life as he became somebody recognized by, by, by his family. <clears throat> so I have uh, not, you're right, uh, developed very much this dimension of the, uh, of the body and the subject uh, 
uh, not so much as subjected, which is what I insisted very much on, but as uh, su subjectified or subjectivized. Uh, that is how, uh, for example, in the case of Mohamed Bouazizi, at least that's my uh, interpretation, and of course that's just an interpretation, uh, his final uh, act of, uh, uh, of uh, killing himself uh, is an act of political subjectivity in front of uh, facing the, uh, the, the, the uh, political subjection uh, uh, in, in that case. Uh, but you, you're right that <clears throat> in, uh, in this presentation, this is uh, the perspective I've chosen. Any questions? Yes. If you speak up, I'll, maybe I'll try to repeat the question, save you a trip up to the mic. Uh, maybe can I para try to paraphrase, paraphrase the question? Um, your your stories show that uh, um, there's so much of this going on that's undetected, and it's it's uh, a real crisis or, or uh, a terrible problem. And, and I think the real question is, what can how can we get recognition of this in your in your stories? Just as you say, stories do um, do bring that recognition to the surface. Are there ways are ways we can and I think it's a social policy question. Are there ways we can improve the situation to get governments to recognize this? And I guess expand the definition of, of, of refugee. Is that fair? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, the, the, the fact that uh, uh, a situation or an an act as a tragic dimension uh, does not necessarily call for desperation. In the first case, uh, you know, the, the, if if we interpret, and of course it's maybe a little too much interpretation, but most people do it this way, that this event, the death of this man, was the starting point of riots or demonstrations, rather, in some places, riots, uh, that uh, overthrew the dictatorship in Tunisia. Uh, this is something that I tried to suggest in the introduction of my presentation, is that sometimes people uh, put their life for the cause, uh, and of course, uh, I'm not saying that he was a political activist. He was not. But at some point, there is an, uh, an expansion of the political significance or signification of, uh, of, of an act, which uh, in that case is not, uh, is not uh, uh, an, uh, it may be an act of desperation, but is not uh, an act that we should see uh, with desperation. But 
The question you ask is also uh, what, uh, uh, what do we know and what we don't know about this. And it's, I gave, uh, in effect, I, uh, examples of uh, elements that are very difficult to get in the media where others are much more uh, attractive for, uh, <clears throat> and we know that's something we, that's a problem we have for any subject we work on. Uh, it's not that we specially want them to be, or we want us to be in the media, or we want our problem necessary to be in the media uh, as, as an end, but sometimes it could be a good means to, for, uh, uh, to, for some, uh, if not change, at least uh, a, a, a consciousness of uh, an awareness of, of problems. Um, <clears throat> but in the case of, of refugees, um, I think there's uh, an important amount of production in this country about both uh, what's going on at the border uh, between uh, Mexico and the United States, and uh, to a lesser degree in the way the refugee problem is treated in the, in the United States, and uh, um, and it's we have the same situation in France. I have the impression that the and maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's a, a question at least to be posed in this place that the porosity, the circulation of, uh, of reflection between the scientific or academic world and a larger public sphere. Uh, so this porosity and circulation is maybe less easy here than it would be in some part of Europe as uh, France, for example. Uh, so that's not an answer, but that's just an element of reflection on how uh, uh, the academic world also, uh, not only, but also can uh, take uh, this into consideration. Good, thank you. Well, we, we have a, a brave gentleman who stepped up to the microphone, so why don't I call on him, uh, call on him first? I guess this is a slash, a, a, a comment slash question. When you describe the structural violence in South Africa by their apar apartheid policies forcing people to work in the mines and work under conditions which ultimately led to things like an AIDS epidemic, uh, I'm, the question is, wouldn't you say that the same things were done in this country and in, in the apartheid policies after the Civil War, for instance, things were done like the vagrancy laws to, to force the ex-slaves to again work on the plantations which the uh, Southerners couldn't uh, uh, run without that, that kind of cheap, uh, 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 plentiful labor. And as a matter of fact, if you, I, I'm, I'm sure the same, many things like that have been done uh, since then, much more recently. For instance, after the war, when uh, white ex-servicemen were given ample opportunity to acquire property and blacks, not necessarily through an explicit law, but through a, a system, were prevented from acquiring property. All of these things have led to a social situation in this country where you have structural violence, so that when somebody's using crack, for instance, and catch, uh, uh, contracting AIDS in the process or committing acts of violence, it can be traced back to a, to a situation which was more or less deliberate, not the, the, the exact consequence wasn't foreseen, but the situation was more or less deliberately concocted by the uh, U.S. government and society to keep these people in that situation. Yes, I, as you understood, I limited my uh, case studies and examples to a uh, situation that I'd, I had been working on, uh, so that's, uh, although I mentioned very uh, allusively uh, other contexts, I'm sure uh, you're right, and from what I've read, uh, there are elements uh, uh, that uh, um, give evidence of what you're uh, of what you're saying. Um, uh, and one, but but, I, but I'm not the specialist to 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 be uh, the the person to be uh, speaking of that. But one element that I briefly alluded to, and which I think is very important to take into consideration, and is so difficult to apprehend that 
uh, it is almost never taken into consideration, is the devalorization or devaluation of life uh, and human beings, and how this, uh, uh, how this, is, this goes from generation to generation, and how then the, the, you know, this idea of taking risk, taking health risk, how little this is, this, uh, is uh, uh, the, the prevention messages, for example, how little they touch these questions of, for example, the miners who risk their life every day going in the mine, uh, who work extremely hard and when you, when you give them, uh, you have this program telling them, you know, there's a risk if you go uh, with these women uh, in the so-called hotspots I was referring to. It's, you know, there's, a, 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 there's something that uh, does not correspond. And this is a, a, something that is very transgenerational and takes time to, 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 to change. So th this is very, very important. Not, not just the, the uh, objective situation, but also the subjective one that is uh, associated to it. We, uh, we have maybe time, depending on the length of the questions and the answers, we maybe have time for one or two more. So uh, why don't we start over here? Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question about the distinction that you make between political violence and structural violence. Um, and mostly with the examples that you gave at the end, like um, female genital mutilation. Um, where is gender-based violence? I mean, as you know, it's increasingly uh, legitimate legally and morally. So I wondered where you could, if you could talk about where it fits into this equation and why you think that's the case. Well, gender and, and, and uh, sexual uh, issues uh, have been uh, not only in the academic world, but also, as I said, in the uh, and in society, but, but more specifically in, in uh, these, um, uh, these sites where I've been uh, doing the two research I, 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 I referred to. Um, and and it's, it's, well, first of all, the distinction between uh, political and structural that was a sort of way of presenting and differentiating, but I showed at the end how difficult it was to uh, differentiate the two. Um, and, and, and I gave a, a couple of times the example of rape, what is called sometimes political rape, um, and uh, <clears throat> so, or rape in three times, in fact, uh, in, uh, in the talk. So, um, so, so the, probably gender issues in particular are at at the articulation uh, of the of, of the of the two, uh, and uh, um, yeah, good. I think we have one more question. Um, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask a question that will help me um, uh, understand a little bit better the idea both of of uh, structural violence, but also of the idea of the trace. Um, so I wanted to offer two slight modifications of your, uh, the example that you gave at the end uh, of, of your talk and see how you would uh, think about those differently as examples both of, of the, the trace on the body and also structural violence. So in one modification, um, on both modifications, um, uh, Marie does not uh, contract uh, HIV from the, the gang rape that occurred in her um, uh, country of birth, but um, uh, so on the, in the first example, she becomes uh, HIV positive and develops AIDS through some circumstances in, in France. And how would that be? Would that be a structural violence? And then the second question is that, the, it, the second example is that she develops severe depression and, and, and other emotional problems as a result of the gang rape, but that doesn't, and, and that that's what uh, leads to her uh, to come to end up in the hospital, that she's just severely depressed. Would that be enough of a trace and a sign of a structural violence that would uh, lead you to think about that modification in a similar way? I, th I think the trace is a uh, potent, uh, instrument to think of the relation between uh, the body and the state and uh, 
in particular uh, through this articulation of power and truth, and that's how I dealt with it, both as what power leaves on bodies and what truth is uh, searched or sought uh, from, from bodies. Now, the problem is that nobody knows. Nobody knows in, in the case of Marie or other cases that I've, no, nobody knows uh, when people get infected, nobody knows when people are depressed, if they are depressed because they have been, uh, they have lost their parents. They, uh, well in, in her case she has lost her parents, she has been gang raped, uh, she's alone in France, uh, she's rejected a uh, couple of times uh, f uh, for her asylum uh, um, application. Um, she's living uh, hidden in an apartment uh, uh, with her boyfriend and has no possibility to go out and we don't know. We don't know. So, so the, my, that's why I, at the beginning I said my point will not be psychological and even in fact the, um, uh, the determination of one fact on the other is something that we cannot uh, individually, uh, we can intuitively think that there is uh, some uh, reason for it, but, but we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, say it. So that's why I took a step outside of these stories, not to, to decide myself if Marie was uh, uh, or maybe I, I implied it, uh, uh, but not to decide myself why she's infected, why she's depressed, uh, why she's what she is, but what the state does with her body, not recognizing at some point uh, her as, uh, as an asylum seeker, and in the restrictive uh, approach of asylum that I described earlier, it's very easy to understand that you know it's not enough because you, you've lost your father who was a political opponent. It's not enough because your your mother died. It's not enough because you you gang raped. You know, one of the problems that we have uh, in refugee commissions is that the torturers don't give certificate uh, to uh, to testify that they've been torturing. And and this is this is really one of the major problems that refugee commission have, you know, when you don't have trust anymore, that would be the last, and sometimes you, you do have, sometimes, sometimes you have uh, uh, in the newspapers, you have articles, uh, in the local uh, newspapers, you have articles where these people are mentioned as having been tortured, and, and so in these very, very few cases where it's very clear, then there's a good argument. But in other cases, the, 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 we have no, no element. So, so your question is not to uh, dis dismiss your question. Your question is quite relevant, but precisely to uh, insist on the fact that uh, we, we cannot do this uh, very interesting and very puzzling uh, investigation or inquiry that you would like to do. What we can just do is to take a step aside and say, so what does it mean for our society to problematize today asylum or AIDS or other uh, problems in which the relation between the state and the body is at stake? What does it, uh, what does it mean for our society? How can we interpret that? And uh, how do we see these changes that I've tried to uh, indicate over time? Good. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Fassin, for an excellent lecture and also for your willingness to answer questions. We could be here all night, I'm afraid, but we have to stop at some point.